نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونظيرا بين يدي الساءة من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسهما فلا يدر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل ألم تر إلى ملأ من بني إسرائيل من بعد موسى إذ قال للنبي النبي له بعث لنا ملكا نقاتل في سبيل الله قال هل عسيتم إن كتب عليكم القتال أن لا تقاتلوا قالوا وما لنا أن لا نقاتل في سبيل الله وقد أخرجنا من ديارنا وأبنائنا فلما كتب عليهم القتال تولوا إلا قليلا منهم والله عليم بالظالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا اللهم ألهمني رشدي وعزني من شر نفسي اللهم آمين يا رب العالمين Before I begin on this particular event or story uh, in the Quran and I hope I'm able to complete it today but I want to talk about the power of stories And the way I would like to explain this, because, you know, I had a difficult time as a college student. I would ask myself sometimes, why does Quran give so many stories? You know, I'm a person of logic, right? There should be logic there. There should be philosophy there. Why does Quran tell stories? Why does Quran uh, give qasas? You, you know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says, we give you stories, O Prophet. So that your heart will find stability. So what is the purpose and what is the power of stories? This is something that I only understood like later when I actually knew psychology to some degree. <clears throat> and there's so much to say about powers of stories, but I'm going to give you uh, one example. And uh, the example is, let's say if you're in a court case, right? and you're going to present an argument. And let's say the argument is about a stop sign. You want a stop sign somewhere because it's dangerous for not having that stop sign. Now, I can go in front of the jury and say, hey, the stop sign should be here. This is how many cars cross over here. This is you know, the chances of risk. This is how many accidents we've had here. And I can give a very logical, data-driven <laughs> argument for why we should have a stop sign there. But if I go there and I give a story that, look, person X was in their car and they were with their daughter and the stop sign wasn't there and how he got almost into an accident and people can visualize that story. No matter how good my data is, the story will always win. Even in the court of law, the story will always win. And so, when I understood this, and then I understood a few other aspects, one of them is very important, and that is a very great psychologist. He actually knew the Quran, he was German, he knew the Quran, he used to teach Quran in Africa, and he even had dreams about Islam. His name is Carl Jung. He never became Muslim because there was never anyone at his intellectual level to actually dialogue him about Islam, but he was one of the main students of Freud. And he had this idea called the archetypes. Stories are archetypes. Now, what do I mean by archetypes? For example, every culture, every civilization respects knowledge, right? Every civilization looks for the wise man. Every civilization needs heroes. This is human nature. This is the purpose of stories, to give us heroes, 
to give us the wise man, to show us the wise man, right? The purpose of stories is to take us on a quest, right? Every human being desires to be on a quest of some sort, right? The ultimate quest. So when I understood some of these aspects, is much, much more than what I'm saying. It's very deep, actually. It has to do very deeply with the human psyche. It's almost, we're teleologically, we're, all, we're already designed to be in a certain way by the things that are, are you could say, our fitra, our nature, our natural disposition is. We're designed to be a certain way. We're designed to think of a certain way. Like the good versus evil. Those of us who grew up in my generation, for example, will remember you know, watching, like for example, Batman and Robin cartoons, right? Where there's the war between the good and the evil, right? And that ingrained, that's ingrained in our mindset. Because the war between good and evil is not just Spider-Man or Superman. It's a universal human phenomenon. Right? That, that all people can relate to, yes, there's good and there's bad, and there's a clash between good and bad. So, stories are very powerful for that reason, is that they bring out not just something of the, of the brain, you can say, but something very human, you know. And uh, in that regard, I want to mention one story mentioned in the Quran. And... Uh, this story is about a time, so let me give you the background, and then I will quickly go over the story. And, and the good thing about stories is also it's very therapeutic. People don't know this. Um, I forget right now what it's called in, in therapy. When you read a story, right, when you're reading about a character, like you're reading about a prophet, let's say you're reading about Prophet Yusuf, but you're putting your own image on who he is, right? You're reading about his story, and you're putting your own image of who he is. But that's not him. That's just your image of who he is. Right? And if that character goes through a similar situation that you're going through, then you put your feelings into that character of his feelings that you're going through on him. And that becomes very therapeutic. So stories are also very therapeutic. And there's a lot more, like I said, just if I was to talk about the power of stories, especially uh, the latest research that's coming out there, why stories are so important. Uh, people that have stories will always win against logic, basically. Right? Um, <clears throat> so now let us start with the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, first giving a summary of the situation and then the details of the situation. Now the background, let me give you this. Musa والسلام, when he took the people away from Fir'aun and brought them out into the desert, Musa والسلام, had one demand. And that is that, get ready to fight. Get ready to fight, but you won't even have to fight. All you have to do is step into the town, step into the city, and they will surrender. They will surrender themselves, and you will have the city. But the response that the people gave to Musa was, "Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatala." You and your Rabb go. You've been doing miracles from us. You gave us manna and salwa. You saved us from Pharaoh. You did all these miracles for us. So you also, you and Allah go, and we don't want to enter the town. You enter the town for us, and open the gates for us, and then we will come in. We're just sitting right here. We're not going to move. This is exactly what is said to the companions of the Prophet in the Quran. Do you want to behave, meaning ask questions, you want to behave like the people behave with Musa? You're not going to, when Prophet Muhammad comes out, you're not going to come out with him? You're going to behave similar to the people of Musa? When the Prophet take, took his first shura before the Battle of Badr, what was the answer the, the Ansar gave? Because the Muhajirin, the Prophet knew the Muhajirin there with him. Because they're Muhajirin there with him. But he was waiting to see what the answer the, the Ansar say. So that's why one of the companions said, you mean us, you're looking to see what we say. And he said, we are not like the people of Musa. If you tell us to go into the depths of the oceans, we will take our camera into the depths of the oceans. So anyway, Musa had made this demand Enter into the city, but they refused. Because of this, they had a punishment. 
They were made to wander in the desert for 40 years. They were in no man's land, you can say. Nor, they had no city. They were just a bunch of 12 tribes, just traveling from one place to the next tribe. And in this process, they had no leadership. They had total chaos. And whichever other nations that were around them, they would come and take away from them, loot them, take away their stuff. They were totally in a very vulnerable situation. In this state, after 40, about after 40 years, then, you know, finally they said, look, you know, we can't be in this state. We have to get out of this state. So then this event, <coughs> takes, this event takes place. And then after this event is when Bani Israel has its first rise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara ila mala min Bani Israel. This mala is very important. Not the average person. Alam tara, did you not see that how the elite, the elite, when the elite, you know, changes its viewpoint, then things change. Alam tara ila mala min Bani Israel. When the leaders of Bani Israel, they said to their prophet. So they have been in this situation of no man's land for 40 years. And now the elite say, okay, wait. We're, we're also in trouble because, you know, we have to get out together. Alam tara ila mala min Bani Israel min ba'di Musa if qalu li nabiyin lahum ib'ath lana malikan nuqatil fi sabilillah. They said to their prophet at that time, now, what is his name? This is, uh, I'm not going to go into this right now. Imam Ibn Kathir has, if you want to pick up Imam Ibn Kathir, he has a whole thing on what his name was and so on and so forth. But they say to the Prophet at that time, Ib'af lana malikan. Look, appoint for us a king. Give us a king. Nuqatil fi sabilillah. We will fight now. Now we're ready to fight. Nuqatil fi sabilillah. We will fight in the path of Allah. Then the Prophet says, but what happens if Allah says to me, okay, you have to fight, and I appoint a king, and you have to fight, and then you turn your backs? So they respond, What's wrong? What would be wrong with us? What would be wrong with us that we wouldn't struggle, we wouldn't fight, when we have been kicked out of our houses and our forefathers have been kicked out of their houses and we're in this no man lands place? We'd be, we would be in a, if we're not willing to fight now, we were, we were pretty terrible people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And then when qital, meaning the king was appointed and they had to fight, because they were demanding it, they were asking for it. So when fight, fighting was prescribed for them, then what happened? They all turned away from the opportunity, except for a few of them. Now how they turn away, the details will be given. This is going to be interesting. Allah is fully aware of the wrongdoers. Now over here is the details. So there was a man, poor man, he was from a very weak tribe. He had no money, you know, just very poor person. So the Prophet of Allah says, look, this man will be your king. Not from the mala, I mean Bani Israel, the ones that were demanding the, how we get out of this situation. This poor man, he's going to be your king. Now the first, you know, how there is irtad, there is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا خطوات الشيطان. Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Why? Because you don't follow in one go. It's one step, the next step, the next. Look at the TV shows in the 1950s, right? Or the songs of the 1950s. And then go to the 60s, and then the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s. And, and what happens to the TV shows as time goes by, right? Step by step by step by step, shaitan takes them to the direction that he wants. It's never one big jump, right? So the first, first is... How will he be the king? He's he. So they reject. They, they say, the prophet says, "Inna Allah qad ba'atha lakum al-talut al-malika." Talu anna yakunu lahu mulku alayna. How can he be a king over us? Wa nahnu ahabu bi mulki minhu. We are have more right to have be king than him. Wa lam yu'ta sa'atam min al-mal, and he has no money. 
I mean, come on, how can you be a king? Then, then the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah astafahu alaykum. Allah has chosen him over you. وَزَادَهُ بَسْطَةً فِي الْعِلْمِ وَالْجِسْمِ And Allah has increased him in ilm, in knowledge, and jism, and body. Meaning he was tall and strong and handsome. Could be one meaning. And بَسْطَةً فِي الْجِسْمِ could also mean he was strong, physically strong. Because you know to be a king, you, you, can't, be, you can't be sick. And king, then you can't perform your duties. Both meanings are correct. So, uh, أَنَّ يَكُونَ لَهُ مُلْكُ عَلَيْنَا وَنَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِمُلْكِ مِنْهُ وَلَمْ يُعْتَ سَعَةً مِنَ الْمَالِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاهُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَزَادَهُ بَسْطَةً فِي الْعِلْمِ وَالْجِسْمِ وَاللَّهُ يُعْسِ مُلْكَهُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ And Allah gives His authority to whoever He wills. This is an interesting subject that I'm not going to go into today. There are few ayahs on this subject. وَاللَّهُ وَاسِيٌ عَلِيمٌ But Allah is, has complete knowledge. His comprehensive وَاسِيٌ عَلِيمٌ He has comprehensive knowledge of what needs to be done. Then, then as a sign, this is a historical fact, if you read the Bible, there are two chapters, two books actually in the Bible that relate to this whole event. One is called the Book of Judges. It's a whole book, basically, in the Bible. You know, the Bible is you, you, usually, depending upon which Bible you pick up, usually the Bible is 70 to 72 to 76 different books. You know, so one of the books is called the Judges. And the Judges is about this time period, the 40 years where they were in no man's land. They didn't have any authority on earth. They had disobeyed Musa والسلام, And they were in this situation of يُطِيهُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً They were in traveling in the land for 40 years with no authority. And then the other book is the book of Samuel. So these two books of the Bible, its details, the details of this event are there. But the one event that's very crucial is being mentioned here. And then the real, the real event as it takes place. So I just want to go through this very quickly. So, because they weren't accepting him as the leader, the Prophet said, okay, I will, a sign will come to you. There was a relic that had the, some riwayah say the shoes of Musa, some riwayah say the staff of Musa, some riwayah say parts of the Torah were there. Or, uh, parts of the Book of Allah were there. Some of them say different things about what was in this. But some thing, some relic that was taken away from Bani Israel but then was brought back. And he said that it will come back. And when it came back, that was a sign that, see, he is, the, uh, he is your appointed king from Allah. And another narration of hadith, it says the angels brought the tabut, the angels of Allah brought it. However, it came back historically as a sequence of events, or it came back from the angels, it came back. And then, by the way, this ayah is very important, I can't go into it, but you know, a lot of the digging that's going around Masjid al-Aqsa right now in Palestine, I don't know how many people know this. The Arab brothers, they are fully aware of this, but a lot of the archaeological diggings, because Israel is very big on archaeological diggings. And, and there's many reasons for this. One of the reasons is that they want to find the old relics. You know, the old relics of the time of Musa, and they want to find the old relics at the, of, the, of the time of the of Prophet Dawud as a further claim that, look, Israel belongs to us, and so on and so forth. I'm not going into the debate. I'm just mentioning this as a fact, that they do a lot of archaeological digging, and they have been particularly digging around Masjid al-Aqsa. And that has many reasons which I'm not going to go into right now. So, the Prophet of Allah says, this tabut will come to you, and this will be a sign that he is your king. And it will be carried by the angels and brought to you. Indeed, and this are signs for you if you are truly believers. Now from here is what I really wanted to start with today. So now when Talud, this man was now appointed. So the first group, they came back and said, oh, we don't accept him as a king. Okay. Now the second group. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِجُنُودِهِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَحَرُ So when he was now going with his army to face Jalud, he said, look, Allah is going to test you with the river. فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْهِ Whoever drinks from this river, He's not with me. He's not going to be part of my army. He can't go with me. I know it's hot. 
And by the way, these ayat are preparing the battle of Badr. Because Badr happened in Ramadan, as you know, where they were also not eating and drinking. So, Inna Allah muqtalikum bin Nahab, Allah is going to test you with the river. فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنِّي And whoever drinks from this, he's not with me. He has to now go back. Can't be part of the, can't be part of the, uh, the, the people that are going to uh, go on this quest. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتْعَمْهُ And whoever doesn't take from this river, فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Now you're in the desert, you're hot, it's sunny, you're sweating, there's water in front of you, and you're being told, don't take from the water. Now, there's a lot of wisdom behind this, which I can't go into right now. But he says you can't drink from this water. Except you can take one, you can say, handful. So there are those who didn't take anything. There are those who drank to their full. And then those that just took just a little bit. Right? Just uh, one point I want to mention that's uh, very interesting. Those people that didn't take anything, they never tasted the water. So as they're moving forward, they're not thinking about the water. Right? Because they never tasted the water, they're not thinking about the water. It's, it never was part of, you know. But those people that drank a lot, now they, they, they're stuck. Right? Because they've weakened themselves. But those people that took still a little bit, they still know that even though it's okay, but as they're moving forward, they're still thinking of that taste. There's a lot, again, you know, I don't have time, so I'm going to go over this very quickly. There's a lot of things in this passage, particularly about how to control yourself. Uh, some of the wisdom that the scholars of Islam have discussed in terms of even self-purification. So anyway, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَطْعَمْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي إِلَّا مَنْ اغْتَرَفَ غُرْفَةً بِيَدِي فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ They all drank from the water, except a few. So the first group backed up because we don't accept him as a leader. Second group backed up because they were ready to go, but while going they what? Took the water. Okay? And <clears throat> now what happens? The third group that backs up. فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلَ مِنْهُمْ فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ قَالُوا So now, finally they reach the point of the battle. So Jalut is there, they're over here, and the first, and one of them, one of the groups, then finally when they meet, they say, one of the groups says, لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا الْيَوْمَ بِجَالُوتَ وَجُلُودِ We don't have the strength to fight him. He has, because, you know, Bani Israel was still in the Stone Age, and this Jalut and his people, they, they were in the Iron Age, they had iron tools, and Jalut, uh, Daud, and Talut, they still had stones. This is, there is no way that we can defeat this uh, superior technology that this group has. So, you know, we're, we don't have any strength. Today we can't defeat them. So they also then turn back. But then... And in fact, it's very interesting. This is actually in the Bible where Daud is given better technology. You know, Prophet Daud is the one who was the hero that turned out to the hero of the story. But he's the one, he was, he was being given better technology by his brother. Like, here's a sword and fight with the sword. And, you know, he used the slingshot uh, to, to kill. Uh, he used the lower technology. He used what he knew how to use, basically, not something new. Okay. Anyway, I won't go into that right now. But they said, قَالُوا لَا طَاقَتَنَا الْيَوْمَ بِجَالُوتَ وَجُنُودِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ ذُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا اللَّهَ كَمْ مِنْ فِيَةٍ قَلِيلَةً غَلَبَتْ فِيَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ But those people who believed, and this is the point, that to be victorious, وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوقِنُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَى هُدًا مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمْ الْمُفْلِحُونَ If you don't have this yaqeen of akhirah, you won't be able to make that final step, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah. Over here, dhanna doesn't mean dhan in the common sense. Actually here, here, dhan means yaqeen. In this ayah, it means yaqeen. So, Those people who had the yaqeen, that they will definitely meet Allah. They saw history in a different way. They said, How many few groups Small groups 
weak groups. They overcome a bigger group by the permission of Allah. How many times has this happened in history? Where a small group overcomes a bigger group. So then, this is the group that finally was victorious for the rest of them. So, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ يَذُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاكُ اللَّهَ كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah is indeed with people who have sabr. Then Allah says, فَلَمَّا بَرَزُوا لِجَالُوتَ وَجُنُوتِ So now when they have now, everything is apparent. This group is here and this group is here. This group is bigger, this group is smaller. They're ready to clash. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا بَرَزُوا لِجَالُوتَ وَجُنُودِ قَالُوا رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا Those people that had iman now, what do they say? رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرَ You know, أفرغ, pour sabr on us. أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرَ وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا And make firm our footsteps. وَنْسُنَّا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ And give us victory over the people who deny the truth. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ So the small group became victorious over the larger group. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَقَتَلَ دَاوُدُ جَالُوتَ And Dawood alayhi salatu wa salam, he killed Jalut, the big leader on the other side. وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him sovereignty, kingship, and hikmah. <coughs> and Allah taught him many other things, like how to sing beautifully, uh, taught him poetry, singing, taught him how to deal with iron, so on and so forth. <coughs> if it was not for Allah bringing one group against another group, which now, nowadays in political science is called deterrence. If there was not deterrence of one group against another group, okay, then what would happen? If there was only one power and it would keep rising and keep rising and it would have no, nothing to balance it, then there would be fasad on earth. But the other meaning of this ayah, over here, nas means mu'minin. A nas here means mu'minin, like in Surah Al-Baqarah. Aminu kama amin nas Believe as the people have believed, but what it means, as the Sahaba have believed. So... So Allah, لَوْلَا دَفْءَ اللَّهَ النَّاسُ بَعْدَهُمْ بِبَعْدْ لَفَصَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ But Allah is the one who does fadl. He gives you things that you don't deserve. تِلْكَ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ نَتْلُوهَا عَلَيْكَ بِالْحَقِّ These are ayat of Allah. These are signs of Allah. And this story are signs for the people who believe, right? Of what can be achieved. Of what can be, we can dream of and achieve if we are really faithful to Islam. Against all odds, against all statistics, against all data, history has shown this over and over again, that human beings can achieve far beyond what the numbers tell us, right? What the numbers predict, what speculation tells us, what the experts say will probably happen. Over and over again, we see this in our recent history and even in the far history, over and over again. So inshallah I will continue in my second khutbah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم وليساء المسلمين والمسلمات إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد so the ملأ من بني إسرائيل they say the leaders of بني إسرائيل they say point for us a king sometimes we want leadership we want good leadership everyone wants leadership they wanted leadership but they weren't ready to follow leadership and notice here in this ayah the Nabi, the Nabi of Allah doesn't make himself the leader. He appoints another poor person as the leader. And a lot of times when you find good leadership, you'll find this exact situation where the big, the big one, the powerful one, he puts the weight in to help the one that's younger and maybe not as strong. And, and just as a historical example amongst the ulama, for example, in India subcontinent, when the Khatman Nabuwad, uh, movement started. The ulama that were in the front 
were not as big as the ulama that were in the back supporting the ulama, the other ulama that were younger. When the Khilafat movement took place before that in India, the same thing happened. The same thing has happened in the Arab world. I can't go into the whole details right now, but a lot of times it happens that the, that the one that is powerful puts his weight into the one that's not powerful. The Prophet of Allah said, Allah has made this young man, Talut, your king. Even though 